The other side of the coin from frugal is profligate. And Marion and I have never stopped laughing about a joke that happens when we were in the Marks and Spencer's food hall in Canary Wharf once years ago. And I had put raspberries out of season in the in the trolley. And she said, how much are these? I, mean, I have no idea. She goes, oh, you're so profligate. <laughs> <laughs> if you want it pay for it <laughs> well quite yes yeah. but it's not I mean I do sometimes feel embarrassed don't you when you get to the checkout and the checkout lady says how much is this cauliflower or these these peppers and you don't know not as embarrassed as when I got there with a courgette a condom and a bottle of wine no well oh god what were you trying to do give sex lessons to your teenagers absolutely correct yay yeah. marvellous <laughs> I had uh, a courgette, so I, was, I had three different sized vegetables uh, a box of condoms and a bottle of wine because Steve and I said we're gonna have to get all three bits yes absolutely right yeah well that's genius a little extra tip in there for the listener <laughs> Welcome to Own It, Your Business and Your Life, with Nicola Cairnsos and Judith Morgan. In this podcast, we're going to cover everything you need to embrace to become a successful entrepreneur, marketing, money, and much, much more. How to create a business doing just what you love. How to own it, your business and your life. This one will be fast, funny, feisty, and very lively. So sit back and enjoy the show. Lovely girl. You haven't put the stove on yet, you mean? No, I haven't. <laughs> I want no wood for the stove yet. Oh, God. What are you yeah. like? So, so funny. Funny enough, it doesn't feel particularly old-fashioned, do you know what I mean? No. <laughs> stove is about the stove, is about the most old-fashioned word I can think of. Mittens. No, mittens. Sm- mittens in my lifetime have had uh, fashion a tr- bit to them and funkiness. A stove has never lived. If, if, I've never lived in a house with a stove. Oh, I recommend it. They're, like, they're, they're really blast out the heat once they get going. There's a program on the on the BBC, isn't there? Called Back to I don't know, Back to Living Life in the Victorian Age or something. Okay. You you mean a wood burner, don't you? Do yeah, people don't call those a stove. And if I bought a house with those in, I'd take them out. God. <laughs> so you are becoming like a little old Greek lady. You, you wear black all the time and you live in Greece. Yeah, that makes you Greek, practically. I know, they all think, they all think I'm highly hilarious out here. You're highly hilarious everywhere. <laughs> I make myself laugh quite a lot. Well, good. <laughs> You certainly made me laugh yesterday with the blankie, the mittens and the stove. I'm in my dressing gown today. Mm. I've got a very nice one that I'm really proud of from Land's End. A luxurious dressing gown, worth its weight in gold. So, well, quite. Uh, I didn't have to have one when I lived solo, but I have to have one now. I'm a digital nomad because you never know who you're going to meet, do you? Yeah. Well, in in uh, you know in any circumstances, actually. In in fact, the next door neighbours where I'm living now only ever ring the doorbell when I've got my trousers off. A bit. <laughs> Have you got your mittens on? Mittens on. I've got the blanket wrapped firmly around my midriff. So I'm uh, not the stove yet. No stove yet. No, because I have to go out and haul the wood from my wood pile to my. Balcony. Oh yes. Yes. Right. Let's go. Yeah. Can you not keep a sort of small supply nearer you? Yes, I, but you've I run do. out. That's what you're going to say. I do. But one e- yeah. one evening in, and it's it's burnt through. You can only really haul enough for for one long evening or one. Sh- uh, okay. I won't. I won't bore you the with the thought. Theater. Love the thought of wood. The turn up to this podcast and say I'm hauling wood. Uh, well, I mean, you know, it might happen because we surprise ourselves here all the time. Yeah, it's true. And I, I have to go and pick the wood pile with, with my um, luxury leather gloves with rabbit fur. <laughs> obviously, I don't, I, obviously, I don't want those cashmere mittens anywhere near the wood pile, darling. No, absolutely. No, they're lovely. Present. Very nice. How's your week mm. been then? Oh, good, actually. Very, very good. You thought my energy was high last week. You better, you better hang back because I am on fire today. But I'll start with some dull little things first. Um, I went to bed on Monday night with two problems and I woke up on Tuesday with both of them solved thanks to two techie VAs who work different hours to me when I'm sleeping, which isn't always perfect, but sometimes it's perfect. And I think on our second attempt this week, we've probably cracked the mobile newsletter template as well. But did you know, I expect you did because you're so geeky, 
that various glitches on our computers this week have been caused by a recent update of Intel's processor, something called Spectre. Oh. Did you know that? No, it's I thrown. It's thrown. Well, it's thrown developers big curveball. Apparently, a program, especially when they program with JavaScript. Okay, there's quite a lot of JavaScript about, yeah. Quite. So the damage is worldwide and affecting many platforms And they're, as they try to put themselves back together. This is a message from Melody, my American VA, and it will take some time before everything is running smoothly again. And she gave me a, a link to TechCrunch that explains what the meltdown and spectre bugs are and why they will affect nearly every computer and device. So actually, if things aren't working, it may not be our fault. It may be okay. Intel's update to their processor. I had a day like that the other day. Remember I put the thing I know. Says, yeah. Yeah. Every time I tried to post a picture to Facebook, it wouldn't let me, although it would take text. And every time I tried to click buttons to do things, nothing was happening. Well, will you Google, please, afterwards? I will. I'll okay. give you the link if you want it. Meltdown and Spectre, the bugs affecting nearly every computer and device. It's on TechCrunch. TechCrunch.com forward slash 2018 forward slash 01 forward slash 03 forward slash kernel, K-E-R-N-E-L hyphen panic yeah there you go that's the one yeah read that later because it'll explain what, what it's affecting everything every computer and every program it said here doesn't it well i'm so hmm. glad it wasn't just me i thought it was my no i've been cleaning out my this this is an even duller job i've been cleaning out my keyboard <laughs> Which yes, you did say, and, and, and having to re-stick keys following YouTube vids. Yeah, exactly. So I thought... I Quite thought impressive. Dying. So mm. oh, and then I thought it was my mouth stopping working, because, you know... Things... Well, it might. Some of these things might be separate, but uh, it's good to know for anybody listening that if things aren't working on your computer, it might be nothing to do with you. But let me, let me tell you something really exciting, which you did know, but I expect you've forgotten. Did you know, Nicola Cancross... That I worked for Intel in the 1970s. Do you know? I had completely forgotten that, Judy. Yes. And do you know what? Nobody knew what an integrated circuit was. It was a chip which went inside everything and sat on computer boards and everything. And we shared premises, you'll like this story, with the Potato Marketing Board oh. in Oxford. Very and there were two, two um, comely ladies who worked in the... Um, canteen of the potato marketing board and mid-morning and mid-afternoon they would wheel a trolley around the building in the morning it would have warm egg rolls and in the afternoon it would have homemade jam sponge with coconut sprinkled on the top so my memories my memories of working for intel apart from sort of kissing very attractive californian men at conferences all revolve around warm egg rolls and homemade jam sponge with coconut on top you weren't kissing anyone straight after a warm egg roll because that would be really quite repulsive. no 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 the potato no the warm egg rolls were at home in intel in intel sharing the potato market board in oxford the conferences were at heathrow airport hotels where we were we were well we thought we were naughty in those days but we weren't really no, and I remember the mnemonic for Intel. Dee dee dee. Well, it still does that. I'm not, I'm not very tuneful, so. No, no, but it still does that. <laughs> Intel inside, that stands for, yeah. yeah. But it, all, all we did was sell gazillions of these chips to electron, electronic manufacturers, you know, in Europe. We were in charge of Europe, I think. And you wouldn't have been on the Oxford technology part, would you? No, we were sharing the premises with the Potato Marketing Board. Keep up. We were up the top of the hill, up the top of Cowley Road, top of the hill overlooking Oxford. And actually, one day I used to get up there on the bus. And one day I was standing by the bus stop at a very attractive man with an open top blue sports car that worked for the Potato Marketing Board and stopped and gave me a lift. You say that like I'm expected to know where the potato marketing is. Well, no, no, no. Potato marketing, if you marketed potatoes, you would not be on the Intel Science Park, would you? To be no. honest with you, I'm not altogether sure that the Science Park was built in the 70s. No, probably not. It looked a bit more modern when I went. Anyway, tell me about your week. Let's not have any more of my life, my romance and cake life from the yeah. 1970s. I am intrigued by the amount of uh, gentlemen that appeared in that little story. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> But it was all very innocent, Nicola. 1970s, sure. I would have been 22. It was all, you know, kissing and going for rides in sports cars. It wasn't right. anything. I've seen pictures of it, 22. You were <laughs> very pretty. I was a lovely little thing. Yeah, yeah exactly. So I have had a um, massive week. After having our discussion about technology around membership sites, I had a bit of an epiphany. And I woke up on, I think it was Friday morning, and I thought to myself, my business is so simple now. I've got one membership. I've got one offering, and it's all delivered through the membership site, and I've only got three levels of membership, and it's not very complicated. They're all set up already. I could probably manage with a mailing list and just my forum. 
And that was such a radical thought. And then I thought, I wonder if I really need all the premium hosting I've got because really nobody comes off Facebook or, you know, everything's happening on social media. Nobody, nobody seems to visit anyone's website anymore. So I went through my list of overheads and I thought, well, it's going to be a lot of work, but I could get Sarah to help me with the techie bits. And if, and we, I managed to slash over $600 a month from my overhead, Judith. You mainly have me to thank for this. Do I? Yes. Well, I, I thank you very much then. <laughs> <laughs> because it was me that started this discussion ages ago about what's the point of a website anymore. Uh, yeah, and, and I think all of that's been percolated around. But I thought it'd be because I had a... I mean, honestly, Judith, it was only last week or the week before I was reporting to you that I, I tweaked and pruned my Infusionsoft funnels to the, the, a thing of beauty and, and efficiency. But then I suddenly thought, do I actually need lots of funnels in Infusionsoft? Don't I just need a no, couple? Not, they nod off when you talk Infusionsoft funnels. No, 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 I don't think you do. So, so, so you've smashed it again. Are you keeping Infusionsoft no, or what? No, and then they're shocked. They said, I've been with them since 2012. How can I possibly have had? And in fact, this is a really interesting exercise in customer service. They offered to halve my bill Ooh. for six months because I'm such a good customer and have been yeah. so loyal to them for so long. Right. Now, if they'd done that uh, without me having to threaten to leave or even actually leave I would have stayed with them probably well this is a good marketing thought and we're going to talk about marketing later isn't that a good mm. marketing thought because you only get your reduced bills when you threaten to leave you know utilities companies and telephone companies whereas you so they're, they're mistreating often these, these these entities their existing customers in favor of attracting new ones but then why wouldn't you if your existing ones weren't cutting up rough yeah, and also, exactly, well, why wouldn't you exactly? But the other thing was that by the time you make that thing to, to cancel Infusionsoft, you've made your mind up and yes, quite. whipped all your content out there and popped yes. it into, into the new thing. So, yes. so what's the new thing? You've put it all, taken it all out of Infusionsoft and put it all in your forum. I want to get drip. Get drip, drip. Get drip. So, so basically, get drip allows you to do um, set opt-in boxes. You know, they're hosted online, so they're super fast. Um, they look fine. And, I, and the other thing, this was the other thing, Judith, I realised that when you look at, right, so this is radical, I, I've left lead pages. That's another $70, $90 a month. So I've actually, you know, I've got rid of two lots of premium hosting that will cost me $100 a month, one for the forum and one for all my other websites, because I thought they needed to be fast and actually nobody ever visits them, so what's the point? And then I got rid of Infusionsoft, that was another $200 a month, and gone to get through it, which is $49 a month. I've got rid of lead pages, which is $97 a month, because I realised that everyone's looking at my opt-in boxes on mobile devices and nobody can see the beautiful backgrounds and everything. Mm. All they can see is the, is the, the name and email box mm. and the headline. Mm. Yeah. So I just, honestly, it was just, and, and Sarah was fantastic. She moved 10 websites in, an, in one day onto very affordable hosting that, funnily enough, Irene told me about because Irene, and Irene's been instrumental in this as well because she said to me, a really good thing. She said, every time I'm, I'm looking at taking on a recurring overhead now, I multiply it by 10 years and see if I can live without it. And that's quite a sobering thought. I mean, $600 over a year is $7,500. And over 10 years, that's $70,000 I've just saved. And maybe that explains why people want to pay for yours for a year in advance. People don't, I don't like recurring. Nobody likes recurring. Yeah, I think, I think it is, Judith. I think, I think because they think I need to make a decision about it once. And then if I haven't got value out of it in a year, I won't rejoin next year. Yeah. Whereas every single month, you you're you're nagged and re reminded that you mm. you're paying for something that you're perhaps not using. And some things a month isn't a, a long enough period to um, yeah. assess that. Yeah, it is. So yeah, so I streamlined, slashed, and burned, and it was a lot of work, but only over two days. It wasn't as bad as I thought it was, and I've saved myself over six hundred dollars. Well, this is marvelous, an epiphany. Now, tell me the name of your new hosting company if you want to share that. Uh, ooh. I've completely forgot them already. Oh, well, never mind. Never mind. Site ground, I think. Site ground. Yes, I've heard yeah. of site ground. Yeah. yeah, I haven't. So, but but Irene said, and Irene's been helping some people out who um, specialise in teaching people how to do membership sites. So, you know, she she obviously knows this. So, what's the system now? Get drip and and your BBB thing. No, I I can't I can't go to BB Press, which is the cheap version of a forum, um, and well, free actually, um, because I Yarrow uses it. 
and it does look nice, but it's not complex enough. I.e., you can't. Well, you probably could actually. There's probably plugins to give you extra menus around the top and around the side. But I needed people put people to be able to see where they were in the forum, and you can't do that with BB Press very easily. So, so what are you using? Then Foro. Then Foro. Okay. So Get Drip and Zen Foro is the it's the full extent of your tech. It pretty much is. I've I've, I've got many chat, which is the thing that builds. Yes thing out of your messenger messages yes i'm not convinced about that yet no me neither and um what you're reminding me of actually is yarrow's done simplification shramko's done simplification you know that's what we all want isn't it life gets too complicated if you're not careful i know and the the, the thing i was saddest to see go was my my app but i you know because obviously i invested a couple of thousand dollars in getting that made and but then they did an update just recently and it hasn't worked properly since the update and they haven't been able to fix it in three months yet and so i'm paying you know 149 dollars a month for an app that it actually isn't well that could be the meltdown and spectre bug by the way no it hasn't been working for, since the upgrade well i don't think this was all that recent necessary but anyway whatever i mean you know is, is was your app using javascript I've got no idea. No. Okay. Yeah. I mean, it, you know, it, I, I like the app and I used it myself a lot and it did make it convenient to get into the forum. But, and I do like the concept of an app sitting on your... on your. Yeah, but not to the tune of the cost. Not to the tune of 147 no. pounds. And the brilliant thing about this is it plays right into what we learn in Rich Dad's books and games, which is the lower your overheads, the sooner you're free. Exactly. And £600 a month, Judith, that's my rent, bills and food. Oh, not to be sniffed at, Nicola, no. <clears throat> Moving swiftly on, what has fueled your fire? Uh, two things, actually. Um, before Christmas, Eric, my computer man, provided me with a new computer, a Surface Pro, oh. which is a hybrid laptop slash tablet. Yeah. Um, and I spent some time during my Christmas holidays. I remember now, I couldn't remember where my Christmas holidays has gone. This is where some of my Christmas holidays went. Getting all of my stuff over from the Lenovo that I had been using as a temporary stopgap for about six months from before that, my MacBook Pro. And Eric had to send me a, the temporary loan of an external disk drive because the Surface Pro only has one USB port and uh, it doesn't have a disk drive. And, you know, gadgets these days are getting thinner and smaller and they don't have these things anymore, mm. do they? No. Uh, so I've had to employ right. something I found in the cupboard, which why I didn't throw this away, I have no idea. I had to employ a bus station. Do you even know what a bus station is? Mm. Oh, it's I'm saying we plug, plug more than yeah, one. Yeah, you, pl you plug it in. It's like an adapter. You plug yeah. it in and then you put all your USB ports into it, which is... Yeah. Gorgeous, really, because um, I can't really do without a mouse, although news on that topic in a moment. Um, but the problem with why I haven't been using it is because I couldn't get sage on it. And if I can't get sage on it, I'm not really comfy, to be honest. That would mean I would have to get out one of the old computers in order to do it. And then you're working on two computers. And oh, it's just oh, not messy. satisfactory, yeah. isn't it? But last Saturday night, I had an extre extremely geeky moment because I was doing my friend's accounts and I needed to do that on sage. And I inputted her open trial balance, stay with me. And uh, I thought, well, I'll, ju I'll just print that out to make sure it works. It didn't work. And I thought, I knew it didn't work because it corrupted when I was moving from the MacBook Pro over to the Lenovo. Uh. So cut a long story short, you'll be so proud of me. And Eric thinks I'm a complete rock star. I had to protect the data that I knew that was working uh, on, on any one of my three computers. Uh, it had to be the, the old two. And then uninstall Sage and reinstall it and put all the data back on and make sure it was working everywhere. And once I'd done that on the MacBook Pro and on the Lenovo, I thought, right, I'm going to get out the, the, the disk drive that lives in our house because Eric had had to wanted his back by then and I'm going to plug it into my bus station because it wouldn't work when I plugged it directly into the Surface Pro. I'm going to plug it into my bus station and I'm going to make this work and I cut a long story short I made it work. So then I got up on Monday morning and I thought well I can't work on this Surface Pro because it's seven ten inches across yeah. and low and low down the, the tiny thin keyboards right down sort of almost like working on your knees hunched over like an old person and then I remembered my standing up desk and that, that I could separate the Surface Pro that has a sort of stand from the keyboard but then of course the keyboard that came with it wasn't wireless and I managed to source one of those so I'm now working for the best for the first time 
in living memory, in optimum conditions where my keyboard, my, my, sorry, my screen is exactly at eye height. Nice. Very nice. I haven't been, I've been working off a laptop for, I don't know, 15 years. I've not been, I've not had a screen at my eye level for as long as I can remember. And then that meant because it's, it's because that's ooh, nine inches above the desk, I had to raise my chair up. So I'm working in a altogether different posture and it's it, it's just completely changed my life wow <laughs> but that's only the first one nicola um i tell you what i did lose in the thing i can't get my scrivener data across but it doesn't matter because i realized i can i can access it in dropbox i seem to have lost my invite to like extension and i can't find it and i think they might have removed it actually but anyway um the other thing, of course, and this is the best thing ever. Like you, I had an epiphany in the middle of the night. I had a brilliant new idea for people blogging on their own websites and me turning it into a blog fest. You remember I wanted to do a blog tour for my book? Well, also, we used to. This used to be very popular when, when there was all that trackback stuff going on. Yes. Well, so, people keep writing me. But anyway, whatever. I, I thought... I'll tell you more about this in a minute, but I wanted 52 people to do it because there are 52 questions in the book. And as of this morning, I have 46 people no. who've taken me up on it in the last 48 hours. And more exciting than that, the video, the Facebook note and the instant article I put out about this have, been, have reached 1,384 people. 334 have, have, com have commented or no. clicked or something and 194 have engaged. That's very high. I mean, awesome. 30% for us is amazing. Well, I'll tell you in a minute because I'm, I'm, I'm obsessed with book marketing, not just for me, but I have clients who write and will they market, will they echoes like? So I'm obsessed with book marketing at the moment. I'm going on a challenge next week, next week in a webinar last night. So my, what's fueled my fire is really that, but I'm saving it up because we're going to talk about marketing ideas, aren't we, in our next section. Mm -hmm. So my new computer and my epiphany. Tell me about your fueling. <laughs> well, you're, it's, it's not about work at all. It's about my hobby. Um, we had a, an episode of Write Club, the podcast on New Year's Day, where we talked about our writing New Year's resolutions. And one of them was to enter more competitions. And we all shared a couple of competitions that people could enter. And one of them is the travel, um, travel section in the Telegraph. They have a weekly travel competition. It's called Just Back. So you just literally write 500 words about um, somewhere you've just been. And Teresa, one of our Right Club group, sent her just back story, and it was really good. It was about um, New Year's Eve in the cafe on up, up the top of the hill in the little village. And it was really funny and really quirky and very Greek. And um, she was round here. We were doing the podcast recordings last week for the next five. And she said, I've just had an email from the Telegraph asking me if, if – um, the, the financial crisis I'm referring to was the Greek financial crisis. And she said, I've just emailed back and said, yes. Anyway, she only blew in one, didn't she? Oh, so she's, she's now the, um, the, you know, she's, she's actually won another prize another time for a play. Um, so she's now a, a double prize winning writer and she won 250 quid. And we did a little recording about, you know, well done, Teresa, you know, and, read, and she read her story. And um, it's going out on like a couple of podcasts. Well, it's out there now, actually. And I, we said to her, what are you going to buy? And she said, I've already bought a glockenspiel. Oh! <laughs> what? She said, yes, I'm starting a folk rock band. I mean, this woman's 58, and she's one of the younger ones of our, of our Right Club ladies. But she's a, she's a bit of an, an ex-punk rock girl you know and she so she's starting a folk rock band locally and she'll be playing the glockenspiel which she well, she'll be able to tell the story of that in some other competition soon i know i know it was just it just cracked me up i just thought what an astonishing bunch of, of women nicola could you not have entered that competition and won 250 well i'm going to yes Good. <laughs> we're all going to we want Good. all of them to win once because I mean, the team is every week bless you Teresa I don't know you from Adam but Nicola I thought you were working up to telling me you'd entered it and won no no Teresa but, but 250 quid she said it's the easiest 250 quid she's ever earned <laughs> oh great I'm pleased well if it's every week I mean that's nice isn't it and she wasn't even just back was she she was just yeah. still here. <laughs> That's not to anyone, but it was three so. occasions all right, well, woven into one. So. Anyway, um, so it fueled, that fueled my fire a bit. And then I interviewed um, a science fiction author who wrote a book called Manumission, 
which I'm reading and thoroughly enjoying. So uh, I actually felt quite starstruck. It was really funny. And so that's fueled my fire as well, because I really want to get back to um, to writing my book, because I've done a spreadsheet, Judy, to be proud of me, of um, Act 1, Act 2 and Act 3, and then how what scenes I've written already and what scenes I think I've got to write to fill the story arc in. And I've actually written nearly 4,000 words, and I've only got another 86,000. <laughs> you're, not, you're, you're not using Scrivener? No, I honestly, it's just so complicated. I can't get my head around it. Okay, you wouldn't need your spreadsheet then because it does give you a court board for all of that, but never mind. Um, let me ask a question. Now that your life is so simple, uh, get drip and Zen Foro uh, and side ground, you're going to have much more time for this sci fi writing. Well, you say that, but I'm not because I'm going to have to do a teensy bit more admin myself, like checking oh. every week whether someone's memberships run out and whether I need to email them. Because, of course, I've, Infusionsoft was a shopping cart as well, so I've now got to move everyone over to PayPal. Okay. Yeah, but, um, yeah, no, it's, it's, it's okay. A little bit of admin never hurt anyone on a Monday morning, did it? No, no, or oh God, no, me, you and I love admin. Yeah, we do. Stop Eat it up. Me. I had to open up a Trello board for my blog fest. <laughs> <laughs> Now, see, that's so interesting because I've never, I've never got to grips with Trello, even though it's a visual thing for visual people. But it's just a list, really. It's like a spreadsheet. When you said cork board a minute ago, a whole shudder went through me. <laughs> yeah, well, I don't use that bit because I don't need to. But in fiction, yeah. uh, I think it probably is invaluable because then you can move screens around, scenes yeah. around. Yeah. Well, I've got your, your laugh. But Steph just bought me a little box of cards because apparently if you write your scenes on a bit of box of cards and move them around on a table. Yeah, right, creative writing is a bit low tech, isn't it? Yeah, it is. Here at Own It, we personally believe that leaders are readers, but sometimes it's just not convenient to read and you'd rather listen instead. For listeners of Own It, the podcast, Audible is offering a free audiobook download with a free 30-day trial to give you the opportunity to check out their service. A couple of titles we've picked out for you particularly are Lean In by Sheryl Sandberg or Crush It, Why Now is the Time to Cash In on Your Passion by Gary Vaynerchuk. To download your free audiobook today, go to audibletrial.com forward slash own it. Again, that's audibletrial.com forward slash own it for your free audiobook. You can pick one of the ones I've chosen for you, or you can choose something else. Enjoy your listen. So, focus of the week then. We're talking about um, ideas, and are you going to talk about your blog fest in this bit? Yes, I am. I've put implementing ideas here because you said it would be good to talk about implementing marketing ideas, but actually I think it comes down to implementing any idea, doesn't it? Yes, it's something where I am a bit obsessed with because um, I, I love to get off and, off and to the races as quickly as possible with an idea. And in fact, in fact I, if I have an idea and I don't implement it immediately, then it goes by the wayside. So I need to get some momentum going, but I know I'm very unusual and I'm a, I'm a <coughs> Quick start, uh, nine on the quick start on the Colby Index, if that means anything. No, obviously not. <laughs> Complete well, no, it does to me because you, it does to me because you've been telling me that for ten years. I know exactly what that means. Yes, yeah. <laughs> and you've had to work with it as well. <laughs> yes. So, uh, yes. Yeah, so, so re- I think it was there was more to it than that, wasn't there? I'll, I'll look up what the other thing was while you're telling us about. I it. think you said something like. Um, <clears throat> you said something like inspired by your genius blog fest idea. I think we should talk about implementing marketing ideas was the only message you've sent me. Yeah, I think it was more about how when you have ideas like that. And, you know, I've had ideas that when I mean, you know, we own it, the summit was an idea, wasn't it? That we sprang into action yes. quickly because, because I knew I knew, I knew if it was a, I got off and running. It's like the right club podcast. You know, I, I, we have the ideas and then someone else has to put all the, the legwork in behind it. So, but having the ideas is the easy bit. How does one decide which out of all one's marketing ideas is, is a good idea? How do you know? Okay. So here you go. Here's a direct question. When you had the idea for the blog fest, how did you know that it was, it was a good idea and you should put it into action? Well, caller, I'm glad you asked because this, <laughs> there is of course quite a story to this. I sit back in my blankie. And then yeah, just... Like you, I had an epiphany and it was in the middle of Sunday night, Monday morning. And it was such a brilliant idea. It woke me up. And the word on the tip of my tongue was anthology, which interestingly, I've worked with another client on the creation of an anthology. Um, she thought that was a good idea, but she's not quite as good at admin. And also her main thing is much more, even more time consuming than mine own. And um, we never got around to it or we didn't make it work in her example. But as you know, I've done it twice before. The 36 interviews with women who are their own boss yeah. and the Money Making Magic group all wrote a piece. I've got two ebooks that I give away but could equally sell on uh, Kindle mm. um, which are 
collaborative efforts. And so I had this idea in the middle of the night because I've wanted to do a blog tour and I couldn't work out how to do it and I couldn't find out anybody to do it for me. And I realized actually that playing other people's games is not as easy for me as running the party myself. Yeah. So this, all, this was all instinctive in my head. It was all going on in my head. Was, oh, I'll just invite 52 people to blog on their blog and then I'll post it on my blog either entirely or in part, link back to theirs, and then I'll carry on the discussion. And they don't even need to have read the book. They just need to understand the concept that they run their own business in their own way. And uh, I woke up in the morning and I, no, I woke up in the night and I wrote all the notes on that little notey thing on your iPad. And I couldn't go back to sleep because it was too excited. I eventually fell back to sleep and I got up in the morning and I told my I love my life group, oh, I've got this genius idea in the night. And uh, later in the day, I wrote the blog post, but on Monday night, I couldn't bring myself to send it out. And I thought, oh, I'm not really sure this is a good idea. I just, had, I just was racked with self-doubt, which is not very really like me, what, actually. What, what, which bit was causing you? <clears throat> well, like you, we've launched many things in the past. And what you don't know when you launch is whether it's going to grab you you know what would be worse than getting 46 early adopters in 48 hours well four people said oh yeah all right then judith yeah. uh, so it was fear of failure was what was which was always my driver actually it was was and i wanted to send it to marion to say have a look at the words on this what do you think but i knew monday was a very busy day and i knew also she'd be critical because she is critical she'd say oh it's wordy you haven't explained it well the instructions aren't right and i had you in the back of my mind you can't follow instructions and i knew you'd find they were too long and too complicated <laughs> So I, I sat at my desk on Monday night and I really wanted to push it out on Monday night. But I thought, I'm just going to sit with it overnight, which is sometimes what I say to my clients. If you're not sure, let's just sit with it. And I couldn't work out whether that was a fearful message from my intuition, from my you know small Judith, or whether it was the right thing to do. A cut a long story short. Tuesday was the 23rd and day 23 in creating the impossible wow. turns, out, turns out to be thinking about thinking about failure. And Michael describes a glass elevator near to a venue where he teaches in Los Angeles. And uh, when you first get into the inter elevator, you're at street level and you're, you're all surrounded by concrete. And then you go a bit higher up and you can see the hotel across the street. And at a certain point, you get to a level where you can see in the mountains and then you get higher up and you can see the ocean. And he describes this as the four levels of thinking. So on the ground floor, you're saying, my thoughts are indicative of who I am. And on the next floor up, you're saying, my thoughts are like the weather because that's all you can see. And the next floor up, you're saying my thoughts are like a dream because you're in the clouds by then. And at the top floor, you're saying my thoughts are like a shadow. And he says, when people really reflect on the infinite variability of thought and the constant consciousness inside which the game of life plays out, then our individual thoughts start to look like mere fluctuations in energy and form. And in the end, he says, and because most of us get that every shadow is just a side effect of light, we don't tend to spend much time studying individual shadows. We don't waste our energy reading meaning into their presence or absence or trying to avoid the bad shadows and create good ones. Better still, when our thinking appears to us as an ephemeral series of random shadows, our eye is drawn more and more to the light that creates them. And in the same way, when you see that the feeling of failure is made of thought and thought is as temporary as a shadow, it stops looking significant or scary. There's no need to do anything in particular to avoid it. Failure, he means. Best of all, fear of failure stops looking like a good reason to do or not do anything. So I thought, right, sod it. I'm sending it out. <laughs> and, I, and I sent it out and everybody loved it. And 46 people said, I'm counting, said, yes, please. Do you know what? I think it'll go past 52. I think it'll run and run. But the point is... You don't know until you offer anything to the world whether they're going to get it. I thought people might think, oh, it's a horrible, cynical marketing exercise. I don't want to help her sell copies of her book. But actually, quite a lot of fledgling bloggers, new business bloggers, people who haven't blogged for ages, people are getting on board for their own reasons. Yeah, yeah. Yes, I think that is why. Uh, why did I respond? Well, I, I want to help. Oh, you wanted to support me. Yeah, you did. People no, like you. I don't really understand the instructions. You're absolutely right. But no. sure if you I'm read them slowly, them. Nicola, they're clear as mud. I actually simplified them and simplified them and simplified as much as possible to, for Thank you. you. So much. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> but I did have the feeling that it would be a good, you know, it's a good thing to have something to blog about. 
Yes. Well, interestingly, we could have that conversation about does blogging make any difference? Because I, I haven't seen any increase in my traffic in the last two years. All the time I've been doing that, you know. Put the well, don't forget it. it won't just be blogging. <clears throat> Every blog I write goes out on a blog, is tweeted, goes on my Facebook page, yeah. turns into a Facebook note, goes on to, goes into my newsletter, goes on to, and everybody yeah. else has got social media. So the sharing will be a crucial part of this. Yeah, that's right. It is it's creating a piece of content that can be leveraged. Absolutely. Yeah, quite. I didn't really understand any of what you've just read out from Michael Neal. So, well, um, it's a thought. A fa fa failure is just a thought. It's yeah. not a reality. Get over it, is what he's saying. Yeah. Because I was worried when I did my, had my slash and burn idea, I was worried that I was doing it for the wrong reasons. But that isn't on topic. What, Do you mean the reasons of scarcity? Yeah, I, I was worried that I was um, knee-jerk knee reacting and that I was, by being frugal, I was making myself, put myself into the realms of scarcity and that would stop me thinking abundantly. And like, All right. So yeah. what I'm writing down here, my fear is, was a failure and yours was of frugality. Well, it was it was a fear of doing things, making that decision for the wrong. Yes, thing. yes. So, it's so more about it's, a, it's different things, isn't it? It's it's fearful. Yes, and that and what he's saying in that piece is, is that's just a thought. It's not reality. Yeah. So I think we're going to in a few episodes' time we're going to talk more about how to make good. You know, know you're making a good decision, but your see the thing with these blog this blog fest thing. We, I've done lots of things in the past that I thought, oh, that would be a brilliant idea. It's fizzled out. But you've, you've got traction with it very quickly, uh, which yeah. is a very good sign that it's not going to fizzle out. It's, it's something that could, with legs. Well, quite. If four people had said it and I'd had to flog a horse to get people to, you know, if it felt like flogging a horse to get people to join in, which I've, that has happened before, as you call it, crickets. You know, you off your idea and, every, and it just goes right over everybody's head and they're not looking and they're not playing and they're not interested and they don't get it. Yeah, you know, them. no, they don't see our, our genius in our genius idea. And maybe it's what's in it for me uh, is what they saw. Maybe they, I think maybe they saw what was in it for them. Um, or maybe that I mean some are definitely trying to help and some are writers who can't have too many platforms to write on yeah. there, there, there's gazillions of different reasons actually yeah and, so, and, and for me it's not about blogging it starts with blogging but it could turn into book two or a book or a series of books because it's opening up the dialogue about about my new thing which is people encouraging business people to run their businesses their way that's nice because that's taking you away from the, you know, the whole small business entrepreneur thing. It's, it's making it a bigger conversation, isn't it? Rather than being in the little, you know, small business ghetto, if you like. Well, I want to be in that ghetto. That's the thing. I mean, these people are solopreneurs to begin with. Because actually, this is the thought that I had. The first thought I had was, oh, what a shame the people who are pouncing on it are, don't really have an audience. And then my second thought was, oh, no, it's perfect, because they're the people I'm trying to talk to. They're the people I want to buy my book. They're my people I want to become my clients. Yes, and they're the people who will be looking to you for, for leadership on how to grow their audience. And you're demonstrating it beautifully here. Well, it's synchronous. I haven't, I mean, what we're doing now is we're pumping logic into it. There wasn't any. Yeah. It was just a genius idea feeling dream thing. Well, you said you were asleep when you had it. <laughs> yes, I think I was. It woke me up. And, you know, that has come from 23 days of creating the impossible. Because all you have to do, up, do with creating the impossible is turn up to the, um, turn up to the possibility of creating something that you don't know what it is yet. And mine was all in the context of writing, selling the book, writing more, writing every day, publishing more content about the book, you know, being able to think of myself more as a proper writer. What would I write the second book on? And on day 22, the, the big idea turns up. Yeah. And that's exactly what the book's about. But anyway, let's go back to the thing about how do you know what's a good idea or not? You don't, do you? No, no, you can't. And you just need to try it, get it out there, get the yeah. viable version out there and see what happens. Yeah. It's got to be, it's got to be viable enough to, for people to be able to get their arms around it and their brains around it, but it doesn't have to be any more complicated than that, does it? No, I think, well, you know, you offer it. Um, I can think of several clients this week who are offering things to the world and the world tells you whether they like it and get it and want it. I, I don't know whether you can. Could I have tested that? No, this is the test. Yeah, exactly. I also realised that actually if I stop at 52 now, if I want, although I'm not sure I will, I could stop at 52 now. I could do it again, quarterly, six monthly, whenever I feel like it. Yeah. Could be like your version of a challenge. 
Although you don't like those things. No, no, I don't like the word challenge, although I'm going on one next week. But uh, it's about book marketing and I will learn about book marketing and that's useful for me. It's useful for my clients who write books and won't do the marketing, but they will be soon under my it's general it's cajoling. Called, the Write Club is, is divided firmly into um, marketers and non-marketers. And yeah. So, yeah, and, and the other one is it's firmly divided into traditional publishing fans and people who want to do it themselves. So that's Yes, cool. yes. But, yeah. What is the point of any kind of uh, art if it's not read or seen or heard? Yes, that is very, very much um, true. Gary, Gary V is, was talking about it only this morning to a hip hop artist. And they were saying, you know, what's the point of being a brilliant artist and having a hundred songs that nobody's ever heard? Much better to get it out there and see if, you know. Ten well, hours. typically, of course, I can see the other side, which is this, if somebody loves doing, say, playing the piano uh, or doing watercolours in their back bedroom and they're not good enough to share that with the world, that's, I quite understand that their hobby might stay in the back room. <clears throat> but if what we're doing on the front end of our business, it, you know, it's got to be seen, hasn't it? Yes, it very much has. Very much you know, has. So my arty clients and my writery clients who want to earn money from their talent, they've got to be seen. Yes, and, and the clients who I have who are more practical, you know, obviously usually experts or specialists of some kind, they have to demonstrate that expertise and specialty and there's no better way to do it than, than on social media and that's why they're getting such great results by just standing up and demonstrating and sharing what they're good at. So, is, so do, they have ideas, uh, do they have ideas that they implement that might help them? You know, what, what, what are their strategies that you see? Well, they don't. That's that's why they come to me because mm. they've got an expertise, but they don't have a strategy. No, okay. And, and the other thing that I'm finding more and more is I'm, I attract people who overthink things. So they're perfectionists. They're very highly technical, and they just really never get going because they just paralyse themselves by thinking about it too yes, much. Yes, yes. So they're attracted to me because they get the feeling that I'll <laughs> force them to do. Well, there's that, that's where you, there's the value of your Colby. Yes. Oh, yes. Because the the nine. Yes. Yeah. Because they're borrowing some of your fast start, okay? and we're just saying to our clients, "Let's crack on. Come on, let's have a go. Let's have a go." Yeah. And then I and then I just share the minimum viable way that they can share their expertise with the world, and then they they get such tremendous results, which surprise them. Whereas actually, you know, they shouldn't be surprised because it's their expertise that they're sharing. So. And can you think of any ideas that you've talked yourself out of or you've seen clients talk themselves out of because they, I don't know for what reasons. Why would people not implement ideas? Never, I've never talked myself out of an idea. Yeah. <laughs> I, mean, I remember when I, when I was thinking about buying that hotel and I sat in the back garden of, of Kim's house and I said, you know, what, what could go wrong here? Tell me what could go wrong. How could this be a bad idea? <laughs> she, she just, even she didn't talk me out of it. So, um, yes. I think when a woman's on fire, you can't talk her out of no, it. Really. No not, nor should you try. No, absolutely. Cool. Okay. So, um, choosing which of your ideas is a good idea to implement is not generally the problem that presents, is it? It's usually people say, I don't have any ideas. But I think, you know, it's interesting you saying about this 23 day, this Michael Neal thing, because I think the more creative things you do, the more creative you get. So, I think, I, so yes. I think that could be a muscle, absolutely. Yeah, yeah I, I've been feeling so much more creative since I've been hanging out in Write Club because, you know, I, I yeah. want to get more pictures. Even yes. writing a daily email to my mailing list is yes. becoming easier and easier and easier because yes. I'm a daily email. <laughs> yes, right. My blogging every day is becoming easier yeah. as well for the same reason. Yeah. 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 My biggest challenge is, is having the time to leverage it all. So that's where the outsourcing has to come in, I think. Yeah. Eventually. That's yeah. where I'm going to expend some money, I think, now that I've saved some. Well, here's a thought as well. If I came up with my genius idea on day 23, what am I going to have at, on day 90? Oh my God, you're going for 90 days. No, it is 90 days. It's a, like, creating the impossible is a 90 day thing. Oh. So Only on day 23, 25. So you, you've just created a, 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 a tiny ma miracle. There's more miracles to come. Well, in the, in the same, maybe this is the miracle that will take the rest of the 90 days to unfold. But that's why I've given them all the deadline of the 31st of March, because that's my 90th day. But it is... It's about creating some big wow in the world as a writer. That's my thing. And, yeah. and, and all you can do at the beginning is slog a bit. Write, 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 market, share, you know, think, uh, you know, create sales. You know, all you can do at the beginning is quite sloggy. Yeah, sloggy. Would it, <laughs> would it, here's a tiny, oh, it's too late for this one, but a tiny thought. Would it have not been better um, and more like a thunderclap if we'd all published on the same day? Uh, we've seen no value from Thunderclap whatsoever. No, 
No, we didn't. No, I, just no, I don't know. I don't think it would. And I think it would be impossible to create as well. And, and I, unless, what I'm wanting to do here is create a dialogue. So they can all publish when they like, as long as they pick a date. doesn't matter if there's two or three on one day. I've got to respond to all 52 of them, don't forget. So I've got to write 52 blog posts. So it gives me 52 ah. bits of as well. But I've got to think about their article. I've got to read their article, post it on mine, some or all of it, depending on the length, respond to it. It's about keeping the conversation going. So no, because of this idea of keeping the conversation going, no, I don't think it would. Well, yeah. it might be in marketing terms, but that's not really what this is entirely about. It's about creating the impossible continuing the dialogue maybe this is the second book also i was thinking about i'm just thinking about it from an seo point of view it's better if it didn't all happen on the same day because google might think hang on a minute what's going on she's got well do you remember um, thunderclap has never really worked no people didn't. are people are nervous of it and i've been i've participated in it on both sides it's not done me any good on the one side and i'm not convinced it's done the the um campaigns that i've been involved with any good on the other side either but you never know do you no, you don't. But but having fifty two new articles linking to your blog over a period of three months is going to is definitely going to help. You. Well, hopefully, and then that wasn't my goal either. Really, it was more content, maybe for the second book. I think. But um, it's funny, isn't it, that I'm talking to you, a creative person. Yesterday, I had a conversation with Tom Evans, who's the the writer who told us that his audio books outsell his written and Kindle books by you know, a mile, yeah. had a consultation with him and he started telling me what to do with this project as well. Creative people can't stop coming up with ideas and sharing them with other people. And if one is a creative person who's got quite a strong thought advancement already going on about her own project, you know, thanks, but no thanks. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> it very swiftly overwhelms people when you give people too, too many ideas, doesn't it? it? Well, that's what you and I are both guilty of. It's a creator disease that. Here's another idea. Here's another idea. Here's another idea. Thanks very much. We don't really want any more ideas. We just want one good one that we can implement. Yeah, absolutely. And actually, I think that's the point of focus of the week. You know, how get a good idea and implement it. Yes. There's the, um, there's the title for the episode as well. <laughs> get a good idea and implement it. Or just good idea. I, I was going to call it implementing ideas because you know how I love alliteration. Oh, absolutely. I could call it implementing good ideas. Would you like that? I don't, you, you choose. You choose. Well, normally you instruct me because you're the SEO freak. Uh, we'll discuss it afterwards. Yeah, okay. So, word of the week then. Huh. Do you want to go first? Uh, it's frugal. I've already covered it. So oh, yes, good. I like frugal. Yeah. It's, it's a good word because... It's it is got, a good word, yeah. It says what it does on the tin, but it doesn't have negative connotations. It's got positive connotations. Yeah. It. Now, tell me why that is, because typically you might historically have found that word a bit neg. Well, I think it's because it doesn't mean that you can't be extravagant when you want to. No, it doesn't. It means that you're more likely to be able Quite. To it facilitates extravagance on the things that really matter. It does, but don't waste money on things that don't, yeah. No, it's nice. And, and I do remember that when we were in the money gym, we did, I did used to regularly slash and burn my overheads because it is insidious the way these things, especially with everyone obs being obsessed. And then I thought, oh, okay, so this is a bit out of integrity, isn't it? Because I've, um, I'm, I don't want anyone. But actually, you're right. People do sign up for a year rather than signing up for a month. They get a good deal if they sign up for a year. And I personally am paying for mentoring via a year's deal. So it's not out of integrity at all. The other side of the coin from frugal is profligate. And Marion and I have never stopped laughing about a joke that happens when we were in the Marks and Spencer's food hall in Canary Wharf once years ago. And I had put raspberries out of season in the, in the trolley. And she said, how much are these? I, mean, I have no idea. She goes, oh, you're so profligate. <laughs> <laughs> if you want it, pay for it. <laughs> well, quite, yes. Yeah. But it's not, I mean, I do sometimes feel embarrassed, don't you? When you get to the checkout and the checkout lady says, how much is this cauliflower or these, these peppers? And you don't know. Not as embarrassed as when I got there with a courgette, a condom and a bottle of wine. No, well, oh God, what were you trying to do? Give sex lessons to your teenagers. Absolutely correct. Yay, marvellous. <laughs> I had uh, a <laughs> else, I think I had three different sized vegetables, uh, a box of condoms and a bottle of wine because Steve and I said we're going to have to get all three bits. Yes, absolutely right. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's genius. A little extra tip in there for the listener. <laughs> right. Now, my word of the week is help. And I think you're going to like this, actually. And um, not you particularly, but people are always talking to me about what they hallucinate other people will think if they oh, yeah. offer this or ask for that. And 
Kevin, one of my clients, came into unexpectedly into the Tuesday Small Business Big Magic meeting because he's a Friday man. And he shared this uh, quote with me from a book by a man I'm sure you like, but I tend to swerve. Uh, High Performance Habits by Brendan Burchard. Do you know him? I haven't read anything for a while, but he's he's generally, you know, well. Yeah, he said um, people drastically underestimate the willingness of others to engage and help. Several replicated studies show that people tend to yes over three times as often as people thought they would, actually, which is borne out by my story, isn't it? Studies also show people overestimate how often and to what degree others will judge them. And if someone, no, I love this bit, if someone does say yes to helping you, they tend to like you more after they've done something for you. That's interesting, isn't it? Isn't that brilliant? Well, especially a, a woman who never asks for help. Well, I don't ask for help much either. But um, I, I've got a friend who's just brought me a cup of coffee who's always telling me what people will do if she asks. I said, you don't know what they'll do. And this thing about they'll like you more if you ask for help is gorgeous, isn't it? Well, you've given them an opportunity to be um, generous and kind, haven't you? Well, which we both love in coming, don't yeah. we? Yeah, absolutely. Anyway, so word of the, my word of the week is help. Ask for it more. People like you. Yes. <laughs> Who knew? They don't think you of, weak, of you as weak and needy. They like you. Wow. And they want to help. And they engage with you three times more likely than you thought. Amazing. Yeah, I've got, I've got mates out here, Steph, who, who's always offering to help me with things. I was saying we were having a funny conversation yesterday. So there's, apparently there's a, a place in Agnick where you can go and get your clothes mended. And because I was asking if anyone knew where I could buy a sewing kit. And they, you know, because I've got some trousers that need patching. She still has a little girl in Agnick who does all that. She says, and I, I said to her, oh, whereabouts in Agnick? And she looked at me and she said, oh, you know, right in the middle. And I said, so what am I going to do, Steph? I'm going to get on a bus <laughs> and I'm going to go to Agnick and I'm going to shout, Amelia the Taylor, where yes. are you? And yes. Said, no, I'm going to drive you to Agnick. And oh, bless. Amelia's. <laughs> yeah, lovely. Lovely. And actually, one's always looking for that. Uh, people that make clothes and people that mend clothes. Uh, I mean, I can do both of those. I just don't want to. It seems to be, well, I, I, used to, I used to be a fashion designer, so I can certainly do it. I know. I know you can. It um, seems to be a thriving little business still. You know, it's actually, I'm very good with a needle and thread. And um, sometimes people, now, people say something like, oh, the hem's dropped down. Give it to me. I'll mend it for you. I quite like a bit of hemming and... Um, Mending, yes, yes, but it has to be yes. a very, very strong natural daylight for me. Otherwise, I can't see a thing. It would these days. I'd probably have to take my lenses out. You're right. Yeah, lenses out, glasses on, and strong daylight. <laughs> <laughs> That's quite a tall order, isn't it? Yeah, but wrapped in my blankie, I'd be fine. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god. Project updates then. You go first. Well, uh, I haven't done anything on my book because uh, obviously I've been doing lots of work stuff. But I did have a look. Only, only it is holding very steady, and um, and we you know we we get ve- it's just steady. And, and I think uh, after my little shift of, of thinking about it, you know, as as opposed to being a, a pure marketing play and a, um, something is instead that keeps us in touch with our customers and our prospective customers in a very lovely way, and also gives us people who want to refer us something to pass on nicely so you know I'm very happy with it I I just think we'll just keep going as long as we enjoy it last week we talked about accountability and project updates for me is accountability so I'm going to give you my book sales numbers 40 in print and 34 in sales I'm going to come come back I'm going to 74 in total first goal 100 book reviews 19 free chapter downloads 30 blog fest participants 46 out of 52 but I wanted to come back and talk to you about sales because uh, sales gives me some very nice analytics and i can selz yes i can tell that in order to sell 34 copies there have been 174 views so 174 people have looked or multiple people have looked 174 times but better than that it tells me that 22 come direct not altogether sure what that means from a link from my newsletter do you think yeah 30 from facebook none from twitter and 20 122 from other i never really know what other means do you but google. Uh, google yes but there you go 174 
to achieve 34 sales we could work out what that i could work out that what that was actually not right now but i could well it's easy done you just 30 60 90 two nines 180 it's a sixth which is what's a sixth expressed as a percentage 16 percent 15 percent uh, slightly more than that, 17 and a half, 18, something like that. Right. So that's yeah. your conversion figure. Of, yeah. So, so, so that's, really, that's, really, that's really interesting. So what, what, what's the sales? Is that the order form that we're talking about here? No, sales.com is where I sell my, sell my ebook. We talked about sales. Yes. Sleep right. up. Yeah. <laughs> you, went, you went, oh, it's for selling furniture. And I went, heaven's sake, I've never even seen that. And you showed me the great big chair on the front page. You remember? I'm just interested to know what, what your, the page that people arrive at looks like, that's all. To oh, uh, judithmorgan.sales.com. Obviously, I'm on a desktop, which nobody is nowadays because I'm. I know, I'm going to have to buy a mobile phone because nobody's on a desktop anymore because I can't see what they see. Yeah. And the closest I can see is on my iPad. Oh, yes. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's a landing page where people can click and hmm. buy it. Yes. And so it would, it would look very nice on an iPad and an iPhone, I'm sure. Yeah. Uh, it's so weird, isn't it? I tell you what's weird. Yeah. I've got I've got a page at Nicola Cairncross dot the dot com, which is where people go to get into the, onto the waiting list for my membership site, and it looks absolutely shit on this on laptop and desktop, but it looks absolutely lovely on a mobile and a, and a pad, and I'm sure yeah. it's the same. Well, you you've got an iPhone. Will you have a look at this for me later and tell me what it looks yeah. like? And I'll look on the iPad, and then we've and we've done all the experiences. I can tell just by looking at it; it's going to look lovely. Well, it does look, it looks quite nice. I, and it's got no words on there, but I don't think it allows me. And that also, I can link to that. It, it, I can sell that exact link from my Facebook page as well. Yes. So there's a, there's a sales shop on my Facebook page, yeah. which is quite nice. But this is something people really need to get their heads through. If you're looking at your own website and landing pages and opt-in pages on your desktop or your laptop, you really mustn't. You must go and look at it on a mobile device, both mobile devices, because that, this is not what people see nowadays. No, I know, I know. Yeah astonishing isn't it it is astonishing and actually quite a lot of issues are always caused by browser i discovered this with trying to get the, the newsletter mobile we've worked it out now but i can never tell the combination of, of the phone so for instance people were saying on the iphone 7 it looks amazing and, and on the iphone 5 it looks shit and so i can't control what phone they're using no <laughs> <laughs> he to tear his hair out about this sort of thing, didn't he? Well, I yeah, can't but you can't also you can't also encourage people to buy the, buy the most expensive phone and read your newsletter. So it's a it's a rock and a hard place. Okay, now who or what's impressed you? I've got three. Warning. Well, I've only got one. So, okay. Um, I I've read Lindsay Spencer Matthews. Oh, yes. Why Clever People Do Dumb Things. And I don't know what made me start reading that. I just thought, I don't know. I don't know what made me start reading it because it's been on my Kindle for a little while now. And, um, the thing if I you like, remember, his wife sent us both a free copy because we, yeah. we dealt with one of his challenges in the we podcast. Did. And she's one of my Clicks and Ease Academy and I met her in Australia when I went to Brisbane. Oh, fab. So um, I read the book. I really liked it. As you said, it's left brain rather than right brain or the other way around. And, but the thing I liked about it in there, and, and that's why you know, I, I think we should talk about it another week, is it's got a really nice little tool for making decisions. For, for, you know, just, it's just a little tool for writing down the different elements of a decision you've got to make. And when I, thought, when I actually did it for my decision-making on the slash and burn, it overwhelmingly, and, and the interesting thing was, there was lots of reasons not to do it, but the biggest reason, which was a deal breaker or a deal maker, was it was going to save me over $600 a month. Yeah. So that cut through all the reasons not to do it, which was interesting. So yeah. nice little book, Why Clever People Do Dumb Things by Lindsay Spencer Matthews. Okay. Yeah, it's on Amazon and it's on his website. Mm -hmm. Okay, go for it. Okay, uh, right. Now, three things. One is very short. <clears throat> one's quite long and one is a shocker the oscar nominations are out and you know this time of year i have to work like a dog at watching all of these films and i think i remember last year it was 14 this year it's about 24 and we've had the golden globes and the sag awards already and they're a good example of what might win but this week i watched a film which i think you are going to love not really because the film is lovable but because the topic is so interested and it's called all the money in the world 
And it's the film, Ridley Scott film, where all the scenes with Kevin Spacey were reshot with Christopher Plummer in it because they didn't want the film blighted by that association. And they did that in about three weeks before Christmas, which was terribly impressive. Tell me again. Sorry, that bit, I missed that. Okay, the film is called All the Money in the World, and it's the yeah. story of John Paul Getty. Oh. And the first actor, they'd finished the film, and Kevin Spacey was playing John Paul Getty when the news about his misdemeanors came out. So Ridley Scott immediately, and talking about implementing decisions, ideas, he immediately decided he was going to reshoot all the scenes with Kevin Spacey in with Christopher Plummer. They did it in about three weeks and they recalled Michelle Williams and uh, Mark Wahlberg. It seemed to me when I was watching this film that 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 John Paul Getty was in every scene. I don't know how they did it, but they reshot the film, taking Kevin out. I think I saw it, I read it somewhere that Kevin was erased and Christopher Palmer stepped in. But the the point is, um, it brought up, first of all, Kevin was erased. And secondly, Michelle Williams reveals that she'd earned a thousand dollars for the reshoot and Mark Wahlberg was paid 1.5 million so this was a became a me too issue and a brilliant man he stepped up and donated his money to the me too cause or something like that both all of these are red herrings okay leaving all of that aside though it is pertinent because the whole film's about money John Paul Getty at the time and for all I know still although he's dead obviously was the richest man in the world who was too mean to pay the ransom for his favorite grandchild on the basis that he had 14 grandchildren Oh, my God. In the end, he reduced the ransom from the $17 million demanded and paid it to the precise amount he was allowed as a, allowed as a tax write-off. <gasps> and he lent the rest to his son, who was the ransomed boy's father. That is shocking. So the film is called All the Money in the World, and it's about what does money mean to a man called John Paul Getty. And I'm not going to tell you what it means because it's about how much is enough. And if you're using money as a compensation to make up for something else you never have, it can never fill you up. So, it, you know, right. it, yeah. Yeah. so the, the, the issues that are raised in it and solved in it, both around the film and in the film, are all about money, which, as you know, is what brought us both together in the first place. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely fascinating. And a bit of a shocking PS, which Leslie told me when I had lunch with her two weeks ago, uh, and you're not going to like this. And it's upsetting for both of us. I also discovered I went to school with somebody called Getty, a member of the family, one of the co-founders of Getty Images, who uh, came after us for 1,500 quid that we should never have paid once. Do you remember? Well, so it wasn't just John Paul I who was a hard-nosed businessman. Yeah. The boy that went to school with me was also a hard-nosed businessman. And it runs in the family. You're either a hard-nosed businessman or you're a druggie and a dropout and hopeless because you can't compete with any of that when you you when you see the film you'll see it goes generationally you know that the the, john paul getty the second was just a druggy dropout he couldn't hack it john paul getty the third who was the boy that was kidnapped i think eventually uh took an overdose and died after after that but when he was ransomed they cut his ear off oh grim it really shows that Ridley Scott's got some serious integrity. And oh. you know, that the film company let him do it and went along with it. I well, think. and that Michelle and Mark came back together. They did it about three weeks before Christmas. And they got the film out and we're all watching it in January. I mean, awesome. When you think how long it takes to make a Hollywood movie like that. He woke up, he discovered the news, he made the decision, he pulled the actors together, he did it. And his film is now out. I mean, it's just brilliant. I mean, what a businessman. Yeah, very good. He's always been one of my favourites because, of course, he directed Blade Runner. Which but also his brother, they, the two of them, they were in advertising before they went to Hollywood. And um, they both started The Good Wife as well. Did you know that? No. Yes. Yes, I did see his name on The Good yes. Wife. Yes. Yeah. They are, they're talented people, but I, the, the business story behind this and the money story in it, uh, both around it and in it, is just fascinating. Yeah. Anything else? No. Well, that's very good. Well done. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. Wow, what a show. Um, I don't even know what time it is, but we're just going to call it a day there because I think okay. fill up our fill up our listeners beautifully. All right. See you soon. Bye. Bye. You've been listening to Nicola Cairncross and Judith Morgan. The podcast is called Own It, Your Business and Your Life. Do come and visit us at ownitthepodcast.com. We'd love to hear your feedback. You can find out more about Judith and visit her on her website at judithmorgan.com and you can find Nicola at nicolacairncross.com.